Welcome, everyone, to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. This is the Stargate Oral History Project. Patrick McKenna, Jay Felger himself, is joining us for uh, this episode of the show. And we are live, so if you are in the uh, YouTube chat, start submitting your questions to the mods. Before we get into that, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, uh, please click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As this is a live stream, uh, as I said before, my moderators are in the chat uh, looking for questions for Patrick, which I will ask him in the uh, second half of the show. So you got a little bit of time to uh, to warm up your uh, your thoughts there. In the meantime, uh, he and I are going to spend some time getting to know each other. Patrick McKenna, Jay Felger. In Stargate SG One, how you doing, sir? I am doing great here on Earth. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> <laughs> how was your mission to Balls Planet? And pl thank you so much for restoring the uh, the the dial home device and the Stargate network to its proper working order, as all galactic citizens deserve Stargate travel. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, I, I do what I can. You know, I do what I can. <laughs> Oh, man. Which Have, doesn't seem to be a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what was... Uh, you, okay, so I, I've, I've got to back up. The first time I ever saw you, um, I'm in high school, and I'm, I'm in a rather eccentric um, instructor's class, and she puts on this thing called the Red Green Show. And I was <laughs> like, why have I never seen this? I live in Southern Illinois. I live in a town of 5,000 people. A substantial number of that are proud rednecks. Why have I not come across this show? And it was just one of those things where it was like, you know, this is perfect. I mean, the the uh, the bits, the duct tape, all of it. It was like, this is absolutely the perfect show. What was it like being a part of this, of this thing for 15 years? It was uh, incredible because everybody seemed to react the way you're reacting, which is... Because it was a PBS show, so unfortunately you didn't seem to watch PBS, David. But anyway, I, we're, we're going to let that go. We're going to let Bob that Ross. Go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that, but that's where it was usually. So it was picked up by region by region. So those who saw it seemed to fall in love with it. So people in New York didn't get it. People in LA didn't get it. But in the Illinois area, down in Iowa, I, I mean, Ohio, like it was just killer, man. It was fantastic. And same up here. All Canadians are pretty much that way, except Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah. So they, they didn't get it much either. So we're really a central uh, type show. So for 15 years, man, we just had so much fun of blowing stuff up and running around. And we'd come down and do shows and people would be dressed up like us. And, you know, baseball stadiums of 5,000 people dressed like our characters. They really... Audiences are amazing when they enjoy a show. I just, it's fantastic. What do you think? It and is? a Stargate's the same way. Well, yeah, that's and that's fair. It just, it's just like different types of audiences, but they're all feeding into yeah. it very similarly. What do you think it is about shows like these that capture the cultural zeitgeist where this, if they get broadcast? It's important for the yeah. yeah. What is it about? Um, what do you think? It. What, let's start with Red Green. What do you think it was mm -hmm. about that show that was? that kept it on the air for 15 years. What was so endearing about it? And I have some, my own thoughts as well, having since watched more of the show. Sure. Well, I think a lot of it was that um, we kept it really simple. Yeah. You know, the idea would start small and we'd get out of our, get out of control for us. And I think everybody could buy into that. They'd watch the thing unfold in front of them, which was easy to, to watch. And there was a lot of people that were, as I said, like the big cities didn't get into it because they weren't city concerns. They were more rural concerns. So it, there was a whole audience that didn't get to see that type of show. So that when they saw it, they started buying into it like crazy because it actually spoke to them. And it came out in the 90s. So like Seinfeld was big and Cosby and all these type of things. So the, that was the type of show that was out there for everybody to watch. And if you weren't into that, eh, there wasn't a lot. So suddenly a voice like ours came through. And it was like, oh, there we go. That's really nice. And you see things like Sunny in Philadelphia started to take off and smaller ideas seemed to plug into a, the indie television seemed to catch on a little bit there. And I, I guess maybe we were part of that wave, which was really, really nice. Yeah. It was also that every week was the same show. 
We didn't, there was nothing current in it. There was no news, no nothing. You could watch the first episode and the last episode and it's pretty much the same show. And that was sort of the goal is let's just keep it to the lodge. It just stays at, what happens at the lodge stays at the lodge. <laughs> Do you miss Harold? Um, quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I still get a lot of recognition, a lot of calls for him because he's, it was such a popular show up here in Canada that uh, it, it plugged in a different way. Very nice that way. So I, I do miss him in the sense that uh, it allowed you to be completely silly and zany twice a week in front of an audience and get paid for it, which was just glorious. You know, what, um, what, what do you take away with you from, from that experience of working on a, a, a production for for that long with a character who just had you know a heart of gold war is war is emotions on his sleeve you know there's to to be able to connect with an audience like that has got to be something really special it, it's nice i think the advantage of the character was that uh, he was vulnerable in a room of men like that and oftentimes i was the representative of, of a wife in a relationship yeah you know because red green used to do a show called smith and smith with his wife it was very sunny and share like so when she stopped doing television, I kind of filled that role for him. So we could still have that kind of banter that a husband and wife might have in a, in a stand-up situation. And I got to be that position for when I got mail, it was always from the wives, always from the sisters and the children. It was like, that's my uncle. That's my dad. It was always, I'm you and he's somebody else to me. And that was, so uh, being vulnerable, I always carried that going, I won't be offended. I'm never offended by Uncle Red. I'm just like, I let it bounce off and move on which I always thought was a, a strong way, the message to send out, if I'm going to be the vulnerable person, not to be hurt by everything, right. to, to take it, laugh along, enjoy the moment and put it aside, acknowledge that people don't think like me and just go, oh, well, move on. So that was sort of the, my role that I tried to, uh, you know, reinvent every week was how to, how to stay afloat amongst these, all these men. And also a certain amount of respecting your elders. Exactly. Exactly. That was a, a big part of that era, you know, that the Steve who wrote the show play Red Green, he did most of the writing. And that's really his background. And it's very much like that. To respect your elders and pay attention. You may think they're wrong, but you're, you're going to go along with the idea <laughs> until you can get the I told you so moment. You know? <laughs> Every kid loves the I told you so moment. <laughs> well, every once in a while, you know, they do have a right idea every now and then. So, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about getting Stargate. Had you seen the show before? How aware of it were you? Well, uh, at the time, I was living out in Vancouver, so I was okay. very aware of the show because uh, my friend Gary Jones uh, works in the show. So him, Gary and I were friends for years, and he got the show, and it was like, oh, wonderful, congratulations, and that was great, cause, and I was moving up back to Toronto. And the minute you make plans to leave somewhere, that's when you get a job, and of course, they, they get offered me with uh, those guys. The other guys came up. And so uh, that was like, oh, okay, this is terrific. And it was a comedy team thing, which I love. I mean, I have that from the red green background. I kind of knew how to respond with the person specifically and share it with the room, which was great with John Billingsley. First time we met was on set that day. And it was just like, oh, we're going to have so much fun because he has an improv background like I do. So the two of us could just laugh and play along. And, and quite a few of the lines that we made up stayed in the show, which was a lot of fun. Okay. A lot of times they don't do that, you know. I think he was Which working on Enterprise at that point, if I'm not mistaken. He had he had already yeah. started that, so he's already got like the sci-fi like churning through his blood. So it's absolutely that's wild. And, and he brought that with him, which is great because there was a whole group of fans of the show uh, that week were on set from uh, from Britain, and they were just thrilled because they knew John from the other program as well. They were just very sci-fi buffs. They knew it all. So he was like the star of the room, the fact that he was in two shows. Right, exactly. Tell me about, um, uh, who, who was Jay to you? Who, who was Jay guy? to me? He was a guy who, like, if they had, if they worked on the 12th floor, he was on, like, the third floor, you know? <laughs> he it was just so far. Maybe he might see them in the cafeteria, maybe in the lobby, you know? Just those, that's why we're all here, is for those guys. And I just really played up that hero worship like crazy of, you know, he's the star football player in high school. He's the guy that if I can stand next to, you, everyone's going to like me. You know, he he was everything seeing those guys. It'd be like being accepted by them would be, oh, this is wonderful for Jay. Because he was always that guy that kind of pushed out of the circle. He wasn't the cool guy. He was science nerd, tripping over his own feet. I always like to think of a character at about 
12 to 15 and then put them in an adult body and see what happens. <laughs> you know, that's socially, you're so awkward at that time. You're just, everything's racing through your mind. You think it's all about you. You're so, you know, aware. And I always find that's a good place to start is like, how would this person react as a teen? And then, you know, what would you tell yourself 20 years from now? <laughs> and then I can build on that. And he, and it was so much fun that way. Cause they were, they were such a family, you know, that the, the, all the performers. So it was so easy to be that guy on the outside of that family and just to be a sync event to each and every one of them, because I was a fan of the show and it was truly a gift to be on set with them. You know, I, my son was such a MacGyver fan oh, and watching, okay. watching the escalation of this was like, you know what I'm doing today? <laughs> I'm working with MacGyver in a new world. <laughs> literally. <laughs> he was so young. <laughs> yeah, literally. Exactly. So it was everything about it was kind of easy for me to fall into. And then the script was so good. It was just so much playing it. And I love that. I mean, I could just picture Martin and Lewis on that other planet doing this stuff. I could picture Abbott and Costello there doing it, you know. So for John and I to be dropped, there was like, we got this. We're going to have so much fun. And Martin Wood, the director, was just lapping every every offer we made. And he'd go too much and we wouldn't do it. And then he'd go perfect. And we would play along with that. And. A lot of little things you just kind of let us do, you know. I'm really glad to hear that you were allowed to feel things out uh, with the material and and kind of dial it around, you know, in front of the camera to make it, you know, exactly the way that you wanted it. Well, and, and the way they wanted it, too, because it, I have to fit in their universe, you know, and, it, and, and being a, a guest in the world. Sometimes, you know, you don't know how thick the ice is in certain areas where you can stand. And there'd be times I'd be like, well, I'm going to try it like this. And they go, mm, to, you know, not really. We want more of this. We you know we saw that before in this other show with this character. We need this. And it's like, oh, OK, great. And they were really gentle about nuancing uh, Jay to be bumbling, but not so much so that we wouldn't believe he couldn't do his job ever. You know, so that it needed that element, too, of he could get there. He just had to get there himself. That's it. Exactly. And the other part of it is, and I'm curious to kn to know if this I'm sure it occurred to you, but maybe it didn't. I mean, you're representing the fans in in this character in some respect because he's a fan of SG-1, just like the audience is, the fan, is a fan of SG-1, if they've stuck around for mm -hmm. six seasons. Did that, yeah. was that playing into your mental process doing this or was it just, no, the show's not mm -hmm. real, I'm in this. I mean, the, the, the show is real, yeah. I'm in the world. I think that's a part of the, the responsibility that comes with it. But if you play it honestly and specifically to the just to the character, then that will reveal itself. Because I want I didn't necessarily know or feel I was the audience rep. I was just Jay's rep, and he becomes the, the reflection of all that. I sent, that and it's similar to the Harold character in Red Green, is if I play it for the audience only, then I'm not totally in that moment with them. They just have to ref, find themselves within that moment too. And if I'm playing it honestly they should see that emotion if that's what they tap into hopefully that makes people connect it's the vulnerability of that moment the the awkwardness or the the hero worship there's so many different emotions floating around with jay there was a lot of things you could grab onto and go for the ride which i i hope they found no absolutely i think that uh i think that everyone has had a, a fantasy you know here and there about uh here or there about um rescuing captain kirk you know, or yeah. whoever your analog for Captain Kirk is you know, in, in a different situation. Yeah. And so he he gets to uh, he gets to execute that. But at the end of the day, it's it's, a, it's an interesting choice that was worked into the episode because O'Neill is not thrilled by scientists. Never has been. No. They don't listen to him. No. So he has some some justification there. But it was really uh, it, it, it was it was a, a huge departure from the show because uh, we're we're pulling back the veil a little bit, just a little bit of fourth wall breaking, not a lot, but just enough to say, you know what, uh, we're going to play with this character for uh, this this sequence of events and this this kind of preposterous situation for this episode. Stargate was really good about once a season of doing this with a character, yeah. Uh, and I I think that it I think that it worked out pretty well because it could have fallen flat on its face. You know, if you're what you're watching this and it's like, or you're you're doing the material, it's like we've got to make sure that we get this right because we're awfully on the nose about this. Yeah, the circumstances of this situation about the the, yeah. the scientist 
who's going to be saving the lives of the heroes for a change. But yeah, and it had to be a very nerdy scientist because it couldn't be anybody more heroic than them. Otherwise, show show changes. You know, that's it. it. Becomes, we start one of watching that him. That's it. Exactly. You know, and I didn't. I wouldn't mind that. You know, that'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Felger in space. You know, <laughs> but that that's the the function. Oftentimes, when you're the guest star for the week, is you know you you're raised up high, but you're you're not forever. So right. you you know that for sure too. You know that going in as well. So no matter what heroic or misstep you take, the world will come back to normal by the end of the 60 minutes. Aside from Billingsley, uh, do you have any memories from that first episode? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when you get to be uh, backstage a little bit, it was so much fun. Like the the, the weight of, of, the, of the costumes, you know, like they're made out of rubber tires. You know the Jaffa, so it's like that's that's really heavy stuff. So my respect for the background performers wearing it all day and running and fighting. You go, oh, that's good on you guys. This stuff is really heavy to wear. So that that was fun. I remember at one point the one guy came up and he said uh, something. Why are you here? And something like that. And I impersonated his voice back. Going, well, we are blah 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 blah. And <laughs> he is that sick. wasn't in the script. I think it's something he ate. <laughs> yeah, he is something like that. Yeah, he is sick. But I was just basically having fun with that actor's delivery. So, you know, afterwards, uh, Martin said, that's hilarious. We're keeping that. And it was like, oh, OK. So that became the thing. And I don't think the poor actor knew that basically I was impersonating him you know, with his delivery. Why are you here? Well, we are. Here. <laughs> so things like that, I remember, because they were just they would celebrate fun moments of of things like when I landed in the when we landed in the uh, the, the stars, the, the gate. I would all crunched up in a in a ball, like because I had no idea where we were going to land or how we were going to land. I never did this before. So when the lights, get, when they said in action, and I curled up in the ball, they had to do it a couple of times because the crew was dying laughing because it was like no one arrives in a new world that way. They all come in superhero. You know? <laughs> Here's a guy who's almost going to wet his pants right away. You know, so it's things like that. They were just like have fun and just keep going. And uh, the sets were great. The sets were incredible. You know, it, it really was a genre piece. You know, it felt like a we're playing a genre of, a, you know, the Bowery Boys, Abbott and Costello. There's a, you know, this one is a fun episode. So it had to stay in there. But the world was like, yes, it's real. This is all happening. We're going to do this. But these are not the guys who should be doing it. Oh, no. That in itself is the oh, no of the episode, you know. No, these are the guys that keep the power running, you know, and and are and are yeah. making sure that everything is working properly. But sometimes, oh no, it's Homer Simpson, <laughs> Homer Simpson at the nuclear plant, at the nuclear basically. plants, absolutely. <laughs> but sometimes I think uh, the thing that I love about it is that in our lives we are sometimes called to adventure, and. Uh, not all of us may necessarily be as gung ho as Jay is about it. It's not necessarily the first line of thought. It's like, well, we don't leave our people behind, so we're here to rescue you. Um, right. Yeah. But I think, as an audience member, don't count yourself out for an opportunity for adventure. You know, don't it, risk. It was interesting that way because uh, it, it's also that world where everyone was telling Jay he was wrong. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it was the. Once something within him was still, I'm running towards the fire as opposed yeah. to away from it. There was something that is heroic in yes. him to want to be able to do that, but never being able allowed to, to nurture that. And this was that moment that it was just somewhat unstoppable for him that he had to follow that. And I think that's a very strong message as well. When everyone around you is telling you you're wrong, but you you're inside feel you have to wow. do something. It, it was nice to be able to follow through on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, you, you, we we sometimes just know what we have to do, and uh, I I think that in terms of a take takeaway from that episode, there's there's nothing wrong with having heroes and um, emulating them, uh, especially if they're you know saving the world week after week. There's nothing wrong with that. No, and and accepting the fact that you're a spoke in the wheel, and it needs every spoke to turn. You know, so that was sort of the reward in the end. I knew I wasn't going to be part of the team, but I was I was for a while. I was an important spoke and I'll go back to what I was doing. But, you know, I got kissed. You know, I got thanked. I got praised. <laughs> it was a great moment for Jay, you know, and then back to work. The holiday's over. That's absolutely I you know, it's kind of uh, part of me was like, you know, that's 
it's a fantasy in the end or do you do you think that it was do you think that parts of that were real <laughs> yeah I, that's interesting you know i was just reading that in some of the con uh notes and so on that some people really thought it was a daydream uh the whole experience I never really thought of it that way. I, I played it all out, you know, and there was parts within it that were his daydreams. But to me, it was that was the moment. I never I never looked at it that way. It was an interesting perspective. Well, it's definitely real because Harak, the uh, the first prime appears later on in the show. So mm -hmm. but there were there were debates and, and, you know, when that came out. It's like that didn't really happen. Just it's not just the 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 Carter smooching him at the end. That's that's the fantasy. It's it's the whole thing. And like uh, no, there's there's characters introduced in this thing that play out later. So he really did that. Yeah. Well, that that's the thing too. Yeah, because I think that confirmed it as well as coming back for Avenger. Yeah. It's like well, then that means the other guys had to happen. That's it. Tell tell us about Avenger two point oh. Mm. Coming that was a Avenger. very different one in that uh, coming back for Avenger. Yeah, because when they say, oh, you know, we're having Jay come back, it's like, oh, great. So I, I assumed it was going to be very similar to the first type of episode. And it was like, OK, then so I was I walked around looking for John so in case, you know, <laughs> on set going, no, no, John's not coming this time. It's just you. It's like, oh, OK, this is a very different experience. And the way they had me working more with Amanda mm -hmm. was just fantastic. You know, it's like and then seeing Jay at home. <laughs> uh, the, the stuff it, the stuff jay at home was that was very much this is your apartment patrick what do you want to do mm -hmm. so it was like well okay i'm going to be in my underwear i'm going to be this i'm going to do that i'm going to be all that stuff was sort of just working it out like putting my pants on backwards was totally like something i just did on the on the <laughs> set like when they did it and i put it on as a joke backwards and then the rest of the scene i'm trying to do my pants up from behind you know, <laughs> with, with a woman in the room that she won't notice that my pants are on backwards <laughs> Thing. I like all those things like how can we add conflict to everything that Jay tries it's got to be some kind of hurdle and they were so great with that and then they had the gentle scene at the bridge with with Amanda again to see the vulnerability and the stress that he's 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 really trying and he's screwed up and he's and responsible for so much of this mess he believes and he doesn't know how to fix it and he's letting everybody down particularly his heroes yeah so the weight of what Jay had to go through was was far more severe this time than the first time. It was more action, more reaction. This one was up to me from the very beginning and I messed it up. Well, so it, it was, it's, it's so much more of it is, um, it's like the, the first, the first episode is really about, you know, being, um, uh, a fish out of water. This one is really kind of like Stargate at the office in terms of an yeah. episode, like what, what happens when, um, your day-to-day -day job is one that deals with uh, people going to and from uh, leaving the planet in your office building. And you do yeah. something that, that absolutely destroys that work environment. It's yeah. kind of wild. Yeah, it's, it, it shows again you know, the times we're in, how vulnerable things are. Right. It doesn't take a lot to throw things off kilter. No. You know, so Jay happened to be that example of the time, you know. And it, it was so exciting that um, they wanted Jay to help, but they they didn't want Jay to help. You know, like they knew they needed him. So there was a great, he could worm his way into things. You know, well, sir, I volunteer to go. And it's like, you know, we should go together. Yes. Yeah, that's what we should do. That right away of whatever gets me there, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> let's just do this. Let's do, again, not thinking any further than I'm going, you know. He still wants to do his part. No, yeah. It's, I, I, yeah. I love uh, Carter's line. Yes, he's a screw up. But he's a brilliant scientist. That's why he's there, you know. Yeah. And I think that it's it's okay to accept that you can be both, you know, as long as you're trying to improve yourself day in and day out. Yeah. Accept your starting position, you know. Yeah, to a and, certain and degree. People, and recognize that people do accept that. I mean, she she listed all the faults with Jay, but she also, as you say, concluded with, "But he's a brilliant scientist." You know, it's like that's what they appreciate in you. There's something they also appreciate. So that's something to find sometimes in any human being is they like this. I'm not a total loser, total waste. Right. I'm this, you know, and that's it. That's an important thing too. And then Jay gets the opportunity to prove himself over and over again. I, uh, my, probably my favorite moment in that episode is the phone call with mom. <laughs> um, no, don't get me wrong. I love the explosions and everything else, but my, yeah, no, my, yeah. the, there is a scene there that shows this this guy um, hasn't always been properly nurtured. 
and yeah. there are, there are forces in his life that that to this day still think that he's not worth his not not worth being you know where he is uh, mm-hmm. and Sam overhears that and she's like okay I think that that was like part of the pivot point for this episode is like I got to try it this way with this guy because it's just a matter of motivation and so yeah. many of us you know in dealing with other people in our day to day lives we know that they can do something. We know that they can. But how to motivate them is is the trick. It's not easy. No, especially if you if you recognize where they're wounded or how they're wounded and not trying to push any buttons on that. You know, we try not to and sometimes that's very difficult because you don't know what those buttons are with people. The the triggers can be anything. You know, so it's a very difficult time, especially for for uh men right now to be very gentle with our words and think ahead of time and it's a very different different time yeah. to to be uh, plugged into community yeah absolutely the um uh i i love that uh the character uh has continued to resonate with so many uh fans and I'm sorry that I've taken so long to have you on to discuss them so i'm I'm really happy that oh, no. uh, that we're uh that we're talking about him now. Do you have? Uh, it was also in a. It was going to say in Avenger they did that nice little nod to Red Green. They put the, the pick up the duct tape first and put it in my bag. That that was definitely they set that out there. The prop guys put it there, and I went, "Oh, duct tape!" They went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, duct tape, man." It's for you. <laughs> oh, that's what, you notice the shot starts on the duct tape, and it's my yes. hand putting it in. It's like they, they really, you know, those who know know that's a little nod to Red Green right there, and then th- that was one of my favorite scenes. Because that that education that uh, that Chloe was in love with him, that yeah. that kind of was a moment. It's like yeah. he's been in the office for how long with this person and didn't pick up on these things. There was a lot of nice opportunities for Jay to to grow and to to be a human and to be more confident with himself by the end of this episode, which I thought was a, a really nice climb. And if, you know, and that being probably the last show I was going to do with them, mm-hmm. it was a really nice conclusion for Jay. I was very happy with. That comfortable, that character is very comfortable in whatever world he's in now. Absolutely, maybe with Chloe, you know, office romances yeah. are. I I love that exchange between the two of them where he said, you know, you don't know what it's like to to you know not have someone that you you care about pay any attention to you, and she's like, yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's happening it, right in front of him, and he doesn't get it. So, which typical no, the guy? Are so good. Yeah, man, the writing is good in that show. So tight. Amanda Tapping, tell me about working with you. Her. Know, what she was so grand because I didn't realize at the time she was uh, also she's getting into the directing as more so than had directed. So her eye was so keen, and her yeah. within the script, she was already breaking it down ahead of time. Just watching her work with the script was so fascinating. And because I was going to be with her, I, uh, she would become the new lead. So everything setting up for her. How do we set her up to be the hero and set me down? And she was way ahead of that, where you don't have to kind of fight with other actors to kind of go, well, this moment would work if I did this. She was way ahead of that. Like, I just had to follow her lead, man. She was in charge of the, everything. Was It was so easy to work with her because you could trust everything she was doing. She helped me on certain you know, like angles of lay down here, kick your leg up so the camera knows you're there. There's just during the fight scenes, I was getting lost. And she just little things she would help me with that, you know, no one knew about. It was just her being wonderful, She, you know, she, and so she's not an so actress gentle. who crowds people out, you know, she, no, she's one and, who who brings you in and, and makes sure that, you know, you're where you should be. Yeah. And I think that really pays off in her directing because she knows the story we're here to tell and just this much of it. Right now, we're not telling the whole story. It's a little puzzle piece. We're going to do a scene. And she keeps it so compact and so focused that then, then the picture just becomes so iso- typically clear by the end. Uh, she was fantastic to work with. I haven't had a chance to work with her as a director yet. I, I'm, I'd really love to see more of that. Absolutely. What, um, uh, in terms of looking back on uh, uh, the legacy uh, of, of this character, um, what do you hope fans take away about about Jay in terms of the, the aspects that they see uh, themselves uh, in him? Not necessarily going to other planets, but in like social situations and you know in 
in in dealing with people that you respect and admire what 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 do you what do you hope that people took from this role i think acceptance really that uh the group's acceptance of jay jay's acceptance of himself chloe's acceptance of the relationship it, everyone had to you know accept something and then move on by the by their experience with Jay. <laughs> and I found that, that very uh, empowering, you know, whether you are the cool group and the nerd wants in and you're not letting them in acceptance, you know, you're the nerd who's not getting in. It's okay. Acceptance. You know, there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I've got some fan questions for you. Oh, great. So summer, you just met summer a moment ago. She says, uh, since you played uh, substantially smart, socially awkward characters before, did you see Felger as anything uh, like Harold in Red Green or Marty in Traders? Or was he completely his own blank slate when you approached him? Do you when carry I carry stuff him, was... over like subconsciously even. Uh, I'm sure I do. Uh, I, watching the show over again, I kind of went, oh, there's a heraldism right there. But it's because that's how my instrument delivers that energy, that line. It's like, oh, there's crossovers because it's me delivering it. So I, sometimes I make more effort now to make sure I don't laugh a certain way or point to certain, like there's certain things that are tip into that because that's just what came naturally after 15 years of doing that show. So there's a couple moments in there where you, you bring it in, but mostly Jay to me was uh, an everyman. You know, he was just a, an everyman where the other two were kind of extremes, whereas Jay was sort of floating in the middle. He he was a chameleon. Like, who do you want me to be? Who do you want me to be? Who do you need me to be? And I'll be that person. You know, and he's very needy. And I, which is something I like to bring to characters anyway, because Harold was needy. And so was Marty. Like everybody kind of wants to be liked and wanted. And I find that's an, a good uh, emotion to work from for a character. So certainly Jay was like that. Well, there's a nervous energy there that's fun to watch. I mean, someone with a comedy background, you know, you he kind of get your kicks out doing that. So it's like you very don't know much. how which direction he's going to explode in. Yeah, and, you know, and because they did the genre stuff, and I am such a big comedy nerd that it was like, okay, I, I love doing this show. I love it. The opportunities they give Jay to be ridiculous yet confident. It was, and I got to kiss another girl in it. You know, it's like, right. My wife right. goes crazy. Get, in going, the fantasy, what he gets the girl. Kissing the girl. Uh, but, well, I'm sorry. I, Jay, I spoke. He, oh, spoke over. What did your wife no, say? I'm just saying Jay gets all the girls. It's like, you know, it's not a bad message either. You know, the, <laughs> the meek and herald inherit the world and herald the world. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> There's my t-shirt. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Melissa Smith, uh, does a particular standout, a particular episode stand out to you um, because of what the episode contained or funny bits happening within within certain scenes of certain people? Were there any were there any uh, juicy scenes in these in these uh, two shows that really that really stood out? For me, the, the one I had the most fun with was the the in Avenger, the, the gunfight scene was because it was just uh, running around, blowing things up and this and that. But the end went when uh, Richard Dean came in and uh, they would say, oh, now you go over and, and you know, be excited that he's there. I, I never told Richard I was going to hug him, you know. <laughs> so it was one of those things of I just ran over and I just grabbed him as big as I could. And what you see is actually Richard reacting to get off get away oh, doing the whole three stooges thing like he caught on immediately of this and that whole struggle in there was just us doing that of this guy's going to attack me with a hug if, if richard doesn't push him back and you and go that, after that him again that was funny. every take every take i went after him differently and he didn't know which way i was going to do one time i climbed on him like a monkey i had my legs wrapped around him and my arms i almost dragged him to the ground he was getting i did it maybe six seven times and you could just see richard was kind of like he wasn't working with me that episode, right? So he was kind of like, is this guy for real? What's going on here? But he, I could see he was having enough of me. <laughs> There's a certain point going, all right, Patrick, choose one and stick with it. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> enough but of you, you may not know this, but Rick is known for throwing curveballs to people on that set. 
like oh, yeah. lines of dialogue and doing things and he's w- he's waiting for their reaction to see if they're going to break while the camera's rolling or if they're going mm. to swallow it and just keep on moving so to hear this from my perspective this is glorious because he's getting oh, his yeah. comeuppance but you you the the comedy pro that you are are throwing things right back at another comedy genius and saying hey what are you going to do yeah. that's funny patrick yeah, it was it was great. And because they didn't say, you know, just go over and thank him. They they said, keep that going. You know, like those are the moments that that's what you're on a great set when they just go. That would work. Breathe into that as opposed to no nope, stop. We have a world created and you don't. Yeah. You don't create anything else in it. It's like, no, nope, they were wide open to this is huge. This is big. Go for it. You know, you're a silly man. Have some fun. That one stood out for me because watching re- react every time was so fun. Because I knew he was really uncomfortable. <laughs> well, it's true to the character. You know, you're being, yeah. you're you're finding the truth in the character in that moment. That's his hero. That's this is a person yeah. whom he loves. You know, this is a guy he he'd walk over hot coal. He he went into battle for this guy. So and and he saved him. Like yeah. you came back for me. This is so great. We yeah. you know I thought we were done for and everything else. And and <laughs> I thought it was great too the way Jay just completely dumps. Amanda and just runs. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Everything was great with her for a second, but it's like, no, you, you know, you're, O'Neill's uh, here. Whack out of yes, the way. Exactly. I'm coming through. Yeah. Cher's here. Sorry, Sonny. You know, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Those moments made me laugh too. Of he's just so in that moment of who, what he needs, what he wants, how excited. But that that whole episode was so much fun because coming back, they they were excited. I was there to allow me to do things. So that was great and the, and the first one was just again the fun of playing that genre which nobody's doing anymore so as an actor you get that spot going oh my goodness i get to make one of these this is great <laughs> that's, that's great david hewlett oh no is in the audience Uh oh how do we join the patrick mckenna fan club how do you not age is it possible that i am aging for you please send him a big sloppy kiss and hug too so here's the hug and here's Uh-oh. the kiss from david hewlett Oh, David Hewlett, how fantastic. David, uh, we worked on Traders together. And, uh, oh, my goodness. And his sister, Kate, uh, did a show up here brilliant. that I worked with, too. He's, absolutely. That family is just so talented. Yep. David, if you're, David, if you're listening, I uh, I love you. Miss you, pal. You're just the – he's the best. The best. The the talent that Stargate Productions acquired um, to make up – the foundation of 17 there's, there's no there's no question why the show the franchise ran for 17 seasons it had Absolutely, compelling yeah. characters and people we loved watching so i mean well they, they really did it well where the crew was so tight and who they were and that, that we knew that family that you could bring anything to that family you could bring comedy to them you could bring drama adventure and they were they had someone who was able to handle that moment very well and that was the beauty of the show. I think you could bring anything to them. You know, and sometimes like like Bob Newhart, does the comedy come to him or is he the comedy? You know, like crazy people come to Bob. And I found that with the with the crew too. Like the world's come to them. Even though they go to them, the world has to be there for them to experience, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's that's always a different thing too. The um the amount of of content that those those people had to to put out week in and week out there is there is kind of like where is where's the chicken or the egg you know which which came first because they have to constantly create a, not just a new environment but a whole new planet week after yeah. week and it's like how do you how do you get that uh, across you know without in some in some seasons 40 episodes that team did 40 yeah. episodes a year. How do you not just ha- have your head just fall off? Oh, it, it's incredible the work they do. It's, a, it's a week, And it's usually, a lot, you see a lot of the same writers, you know, so it's the world is pretty darn tight. It's amazing. But it was one of the best sets I've ever been on because so many of them came from MacGyver mm-hmm. right on to SG-1. So some of these people have been together 20 years. You know, they've seen children born and people pass and marriages and divorces. They It was such an a comfortable place to walk into as well but i think they felt they could also trust any department to excel whether it was props or set design you know that each one was incredibly important uh, again going back to the spoke element how many spokes in that wheel turned every week for that many seasons it was an amazing place 
Lock Watcher, you were in episodic television in Traders, R- Red Green. What are the responsibilities of being a main as opposed to uh, the guest star in um, uh, uh, in the other guys in Avengers? How how as an actor, where? Where do your energies come in from week to week, knowing that you've got you're saddled with a show, churning out episode after episode, as opposed to coming in and and playing with a uh, with a new team for for a couple of shows? Like what? Where Each where are your really... responsibilities and energies? How do you get into that? Each one is is a different responsibility and uh, comfort zone. Like I found when I was doing the show week to week, really easy to do the character, really easy to memorize lines. Because it was just, you were flowing naturally. Mm. And I remember watching guest stars going, boy, they're really good. I'm going to have to remember how tight they are. Because it's almost like double Dutch skipping on a show. Yeah. And then you got to come in and double Dutch skip with them. They've been doing it for 20 years. And now you got to do it at the same rhythm and speed as them. So it's much harder to be a guest star that way. Because it's much easier to trip up. <laughs> when, you're the, when you are these guys, it's not so bad. You know the rhythm. You know how to, you know how to dance. You know how to move next. And your responsibility within the group, too. Am I the funny guy? Am I the smart guy? Am I the science guy? Am I the nerd? Am I the sexy one? Am I the, you know, afraid of one? Am I, who am I within? What spoke am I in that wheel as well? And that's your responsibility week to week. So each one brings a different uh, set of luggage that you have to bring with you. I find being in a show as a regular fantastic because now your character is growing over 15 seasons, over 10 seasons. You know, you don't get that in a movie. <laughs> you no. get two hours, you know. So this is that's always great. And as a guest star, it's the one in time. You've come in fully ex- explored and you're dropping in this moment and moving on again. <laughs> maybe to prison, maybe to death, who knows, <laughs> but you're moving on. <laughs> so each one comes with a different uh, set of suitcases that you have to bring with you on the day. Is it- but, you know, I'll t- I, when I say to actors, though, if you get a call sheet and you're number one, there's a certain energy as number one that you have to carry. That's, that's a lot of responsibility. Do you blow up on a set or do you laugh on a set? Do you go right back to your dressing room? Do you converse? It all comes from number one. And then how that energy comes. I love being number four or five because one, two, and three are usually the heroes of the show. So they're going to be the same every week to some degree. Their choice is what they can do. Four, five, and six, that's where the writers get interesting because it's like they can do all the stuff that the heroes can't do. They can cause the trouble. They can come up with the weird ideas. They can do this. They can do. So I like those ones because that's more where I fit in of maybe a troublemaker, maybe a new idea where I don't have to be the same every week. Well, you facilitate story. Exactly. That's a nice place to be down there in those numbers. People go, oh, you know, number number one is a huge responsibility and you're going to be the same every week. And if you're in the some type of show, that can be a very difficult uh, bag to carry. If you're an adventure, it's great because you're doing something different, but. You know, courtroom dramas, number one. Boy, boy, that's a lot of lingo you're going to be memorizing. Oh, man. And responsibility, for sure. Exactly. So. Yeah. I've been on sets with bad number ones and sets with great number ones. And that's where I learned it. It really does trickle down from there. The, the crew reacts to it. Everybody reacts. The director is feeding it, being defensive to it. It all comes from that energy. Stargate was a big production. And you've done a mm-hmm. lot of work. Where did it stand in terms of... Um, your barometer for professionalism, for quality, you know, for uh, communication between people, exchange of ideas, flexibility. Where does it stand in terms yeah, of I your like uh, pantheon of content that you've worked on, your body of content? I, and I don't, I really don't say this lightly. It's number one. It really is because they had been working together for so long. The machine was working so well. Call sheets were there, pickups were there, drivers were there, cast was on time, scripts were delivered, changes were delivered, emails were received. Never an issue whatsoever. It was just smooth. And as I said, when you step on set, there's this family already going and you're just another guest who's welcome to stay for Sunday dinner. You know, and then it it was, it really was, was, and it was universal, you know, in the sense of the production company had enough money to, to make everybody comfortable. I was in a wonderful hotel wonderful per diems, restaurants. They took care of me with the, here's something you can do at night if you like to go out or this or that. And it was really, really well done. And and because they had that advantage of working so long, they, they had those legs to stand on, whereas a lot of the productions oftentimes, it, you know, it's one season, it's a movie, they're going to hit and run and move on. You know, so things can be a little sloppy around the edges. It'll pay off 
when we're done. They didn't have time for that. You know, it was like, no, this has to be sh- shot. We got another one next week and another one next week. It's a so huge it was machine and it's not slowing down. No, so. no, you have to come prepared. That's another thing too. There's no, I don't know my lines. And and there, there's a lot of space talk that you got to learn sometimes that, uh, you know, me learning true. gold, gold was, you know, forever. Then I'm like, no, I go, no, no, gold, no, gold, no. And it was really like, oh my goodness, it's a made up language. Who cares? Everybody cares. That's who cares. That's right. Know say it. <laughs> wow. You know, that was my reminder of, no, you're the guest. Everyone else is here knows exactly this world. It's Gould. Say, yeah. say it properly. You know, it's like, it took oh, a long time. Gould. Yeah. They, you know, it was amazing. Like, oh, wow. okay. Wow. They have respect for the worlds they, they create too. Yeah, Absolutely. Teresa MC, is there a character um, or a role that you would like to tackle that you haven't yet? Um, Theater, <laughs> would, staged, film. Yeah, you know, I would love to play a um, like a, a, a preacher, a minister, a Baptist minister. I think uh, would be something. I do a lot of. Uh, for some reason, this instrument that I have comes across as car salesman extroverted type people a lot and it's like that's one i haven't had yet was i love to let me see if i can do it on mass <laughs> <laughs> if i can turn this uh irish charm on for mass appeal let's see if that would be good i would like to see that you know i would try that but otherwise i mean i try to there's a lot of offers being my age now i've had a lot of opportunities to play different roles that's why i had to pause because i had some fantastic roles but there's a few that I won't do. I won't do pedophiles. I won't do rapists. I won't do people who harm other people. You know, that's just, I say no right up to that. And people, wouldn't it be great to see Harold as a murderer? You know, it's like, uh, maybe in a one hour show I would, but never children. I'm never going to hit a woman. I'm never going to hurt somebody that's lesser than me. That's, I've been playing opposite that for my entire career. So I'm not going to start doing opposite that now. So th- those are both the only characters I, I won't do. They, there's a certain amount of letting them under your skin that you have to do in order to get them to work. And that's, that's the thing that uh, people don't seem to understand is like as an actor, your job is to justify. So if, if I have to justify those thoughts, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. I don't think it's necessary. I don't find it entertaining. Mm-hmm. So that's a place I don't like to go to because if I have to play it honestly, then you have to play it honestly. And that's a pretty horrible world to have to kind of drop into for a while. And as a father and, and a husband and a, and a son, every, everything about it was like, I, I can't do this honestly. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not committed to it. I'm, yeah. I'm hiding. I'm backing away from it. So that tells me that I'm not doing the best job. Someone else should probably do this. Yeah, if you're not going to be able to, to render it justice. And on top of that, you know, you don't necessarily want those thoughts. So yeah, no, if you have to no, justify it. That makes a lot of sense. If you have to justify you're not just reading lines. You're you're no. inhabiting, you know, a, a persona. And that's that's to me is the simplest explanation of acting is to justify the script. Make that line make sense. Why are you saying it? What's it going to do? Justify why you're doing that. And then it just becomes much easier to to do that. And in doing so, you also challenge the character. Why would he think that? Why would he say that? You, you discover the character by challenging yourself to justify every line mm. that he's thinking or doing trying to get in the writer's head to see where they were when they were trajectorying this character. Yeah. Cause as an, when you read the script, sometimes you go, Oh, that's going to be a good one. I get to be, you know, I get to wear cool clothes in that one. And I get to do that. Sometimes you forget the message that you're, you know, transmitting throughout the script, especially in well-written scripts. Mm-hmm. You got to respect it's a well-written script and look for that underneath the line. Maybe there's something there that I am not reading. You know, I really appreciate those thoughts, Patrick, because it makes it, it's not necessarily saying that this is like, it's like, isn't an important part to play or an important story that needs to be told. But like, your your talent, your facilities don't justify this. They don't fit yeah. into this box, and that's okay. You know. Yeah. Because I, when I started acting, and I had a, a, an older actor tell me, "Goes, just think of yourself that you're in an orchestra, and yeah. sometimes they need a French horn, yeah. sometimes they don't. When they call for the French horn, be ready to play. Yeah. But don't assume it's in every song." And that was a great analogy for me to kind of carry that sometimes I'm a French horn, I'm unique, and sometimes I'll be called upon, and a lot of times I won't. I may say, do you need this sound? I'll go to an audition going, I'm a French horn, 
and going, oh, we love French horns, but not in this song. We'll, we'll call you back, French horn. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later. That's, that's Eventually, we'll need a French horn. That's yeah. It. And, it, and it saves me a lot of time going, that's okay. I'm not going to carry grief about I didn't get that gig or this or that. It's they didn't need what I present. Life's too short. Way too short. And there's a lot of projects that do and others don't. So it's all good. Tune Tamasha. This is this is a nice one to finish on, I think. Tune Tamasha wants to know. Uh, Patrick, do you have a place where where you go clear your mind to feed the ducks, as it were? <laughs> Actually, you know, yes. Um, I have I bought it a few years ago and I'm living in it now. But because I was living in the city and it was one of those things, I got hurt in an accident and it was one of those of uh if I get out of this, I'm uh, changing my life and I'm going to go move up to the country and just live my life. So I, I was got out of the hospital and I was able to do that. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've come up here and I, I just live my life now. I sort of semi-retired. I pick work when I want it. Just it's a much easier way to do things. Okay. So I'm at my pond. Ah, OK. Yeah. It, and, um, you know, I, I'm in a similar situation in, in my life. I, I just turned 40 a couple of months ago and I think... Um, you're I, a kid. I know. <laughs> Trust me, you're a kid. You think it's a lot right now? I am the future. <laughs> David, I am your future. Look at, see the beard? See this? Yeah. Okay. This is you, my son. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important to, um, uh, like, you, it sounds like you, you said that you had an accident that, that made, that ha was your pivot point um, to, to assess where you are with the people you're with in your life and um, make sure that you always have a quiet place for yourself and um, to always fasten to your North star, reset to your North star. Cause we wander, yeah. you know, and, we meander. So. And in particular as, as an actor, you're, you're asked to do that, you know, so you have to get shipped a lot. So it's, it's nice to have a place to come back to, uh, you know, the center yourself and have that and uh, regroup. So you can kind of go remind yourself who I am so I can feed it into the next project. You know, you got to get back to neutral before you go back into drive. Absolutely. That's it. Exactly. Sir, <laughs> this was such a pleasure. I really appreciate having you on. This was, um, oh, thanks, David. this was fun to go through. So good. Good. I really enjoyed it. I, I love the show and I love what you do. And thank you so much for keeping it alive and, and celebrating it the way it deserves to be. Well, I, I appreciate you, Patrick. I thank you for for sharing so much of yourself and um, uh, for exploring uh, uh, this character and and just and just being here with us. So, thank you for your time, sir. Alrighty, I'll Take be care. in touch with you. Be well. You too. Bye bye now. Bye, -bye, bye now. summer. <laughs> bye summer. <laughs> Patrick McKenna, everyone. <laughs> Jay Felger in Stargate SG One. What a cool guy. Thank you so much uh, for for tuning in. I appreciate um, uh, my moderators for making this uh, uh, episode every episode possible. Uh, really could not uh, pull this off without my team: Summer, Tracy, uh, Anthony, Jeremy, and Reese. You guys make the show possible week in and um, and week out. My thanks to Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web. He's uh, my web developer who keeps dialthegate.com up and running. If you go to dialthegate.com, we've got nine upcoming shows that are planned. Three or four of them now have dates, um, but uh, go over there and, and keep an eye on what's going to be coming down the pipe. Some of these I'm really, really excited. I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but uh, some of these I'm really excited about. So, And thank you to my moder uh, to my producer, Linda Gate Gabber fury for uh, continuing to uh, be my stick and rudder and uh, continue to help me churn out these uh, episodes as we go into this super extended third season we've got a few more few more to go so we're gonna we're gonna get those out to you my name is david reed for dial the gate i appreciate you tuning in and uh, we will see you on the other side Sir, it's such a pleasure to have you.